So nice. Good evening, everybody. We're going to start in a couple minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Let the Rivers Run Free. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to log on, but in the meantime, I'm going to drop the link for the Charles River Navigation Project in the chat. If you're looking for more information, you can go check it out over there, but we'll obviously be talking about this during our presentation tonight. Okay, it's uh, around 7.02, so I think some people still might be trickling in, but we might get started. Um, welcome to Let the Rivers Run Free, a discussion of dam removal and recreation in the Charles River watershed. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I, as you log in, I did put in the chat, um, the Charles River Navigation Project, that uh, this is the first event in the virtual event series, kicking off the Charles River Navigation Project, which we will discuss throughout tonight's presentation. Um, and I think we are ready to get started. So tonight, you might notice tonight's a webinar style presentation. Um, that means we have a Q&A for questions. So you can put anything into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And towards the end, we will go through and talk about all the exciting things you have to bring up. Um, 
and there's also the chat box so at any time if you're having any technical difficulties you can chat us directly and i will be monitoring the chat and respond to you and we have a nice heron <laughs> So before we begin, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. Our work at Sierra WA is carried out across the Charles River watershed and the Charles River watershed resides on the occupied territory of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes. We humbly recognize and acknowledge these people as the past, present and future caretakers of the land at which our work carries out on. So here at CRWA, I'm sure you might know a little bit about our work if you found this recording, but our mission is to protect and restore and enhance the Charles River and its watershed lands through science, advocacy, and the law. We were founded in 1965 by a coalition of concerned residents who saw a river polluted, filled with trash, um, totally degraded, and we are founded to totally transform the river. We're one of the oldest watershed associations in the country, and we partner with EPA, state agencies, and 35 watershed municipalities to clean up the river and make change and prepare for climate change. And we have an interdisciplinary staff of about 12 people who um, work together for a variety of different program areas like river science, bringing green infrastructure to our watershed, climate change adaptation, and using law, advocacy, and policy to, um, to make change. And I'm going to pass it to Robert, who will give uh, an overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and the, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Charles River Watershed. Many of you may know, but if you don't know, the Charles River Watershed has 35 different communities in which it resides. And you can see on the map here on the left. And also the main stem of the Charles River includes 19 dams, which we will be talking about many of them tonight. Um, and these dams range in ages of 44 years, uh, 244 years old. Three of them have been breached four are in poor condition and one is rated in unsafe condition um, as we've been finding out. And this picture here is of Watertown Dam. And now I am happy to introduce our panelists who will be speaking tonight. So tonight we have Cameron Salvatore, who is a freelance film director, athlete, and all around adventure seeker who set the record for the first and fastest single-handed unsupported source to sea navigation of the Charles River. Um, back in August, 2020, Cam paddled the entire 80 mile length of the river for CRWA and witnessed a side of the river that was completely different than the revered lower basin that we're so used to seeing. Um, Cam really paddled, portaged, pushed his way all the way from Echo Lake and Hopkinton down to the harbor. And it was a feat of endurance and um, just passion for paddling and our river itself. Um, Cam is a Watertown resident who has always appreciated the Charles and then uh, went out and decided to see every inch of it. And then we have Robert Kearns, our climate resilience specialist at Charles River Watershed Association, who leads the efforts to restore free flowing, resilient Charles River for future generations. Um, in addition to dam removal, Robert is also leading work to train municipalities to adapt to climate change and prepare for its impacts, and also leading the River Advocates Program, which is a volunteer program at CRWA. And now I'm going to pass it to Cam, who will give an introduction. But first, we will watch a short trailer about his journey back in August 2020. So here we are on the Charles River. Not what you expected, is it? Hi, I'm Cam Salvatore, 
In August 2020, I set a speed record for the first unsupported source to sea navigation of the Charles River. Whew, still got a ways to go though. Join me with the Charles River Watershed Association on my chat explaining the 80 mile kayak through Massachusetts, where you'll see parts of the river you've never seen before. We'll speak on environmental issues and dry summer conditions of the river, as well as some technical and surprising revelations on my journey. Hope to see you there. So as oar weavers, there's line in the walls. Those are all spiders. Thirty-six point eight to go. Let's do it. Woo! Oh yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, thanks for having me back for another chat. Um, it was a pleasure to do that talk and explain um, the reason for the navigation project and talk my way through um, that process. Um, happy to do it here again and kind of give some uh, flavor and some color commentary for um, the you know technical and important aspects that Robert's going to be talking about today. Um, the navigation project started as kind of a um, a fantasy to be able to get from one end of the Charles River to the other. And it transformed into um, something I feel like uh, something bigger and something that I feel like can get even bigger with the, um, I'm attempting it again later this year. And um, hopefully with um, everyone's support and with the Charles River Watershed Association, uh, making it into something that uh, can really help bring awareness and um, some knowledge to parts of the river that don't usually get the shine that they do or that other areas do, I should say. So here we are. On oh, not again. <laughs> um, yeah, I got to go see uh, many different parts of the river. Um, a lot of it during 2020 uh, in August was in severe drought um, at the time. So I ended up for the higher part of the river um, dragging the kayak for some time. So even uh, through the dams, over the dams that we have been, uh, that we will be talking about this evening, um, on top of that, going through obstructions and low water th throughout areas of the river. Cool, thank you so much, Cam. And Cam's really, his incredible journey is really a feat of human endurance and a testament to the state of the Charles River that we see today. And like Cam said, he's gone over and around 19 dams that interrupt the flow of the river. And in our presentation today, we're going to talk about some of the obstacles these dams pose to the Charles River ecosystem and travel along Cam's route from the source to the sea um, and see some of the more interesting dams, the dams that are in sort of worse condition um, physically, and talk about, like Cam said, interesting stories along the way and um, including two of the dams that are under consideration for removal and that CRWA supports removing, including the Watertown Dam and the South Natick Dam. And just sort of to get some background on, you know, the state of dams in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, I wanna start off with a couple slides. So this uh, is showing all of the dams that are in Massachusetts. There's over 3,000 dams in the state many of which are relics of history and serve no purpose. Similar to some of the dams we're talking about tonight, old mill structures. And in the past 12 years, 60 dams have been removed in the Commonwealth, opening up over 300 miles of free flowing river. And all of that construction work has created 13 jobs for every $1 million spent. So it's also driving the economy of the Commonwealth. And as we know, as a result of rising greenhouse gas emissions in a changing climate in the Northeast, we're expecting to see more extreme precipitation, urban heat island effect and other impacts, including flooding, as you can see on uh, the screen. And these impacts are not being equally distributed. Um, people of color and environmental justice communities are being and will be hit hardest by this flooding. And when you think of flooding, you have to think about the image on the right in the seaport with coastal flooding, but we're gonna see a lot more of this inland flooding, the rainfall events that shut down um, 
the orange line during um, remnants of uh, Hurricane Ida, as well as instances like the 2010 floods that impacted Moody Street Dam. And people may be wondering, so why, why are we thinking about dam removal in general? Um, you know, dams cost money to the dam owner. And some of these dams are privately owned and some of them are publicly owned by the city and town, but also the state Department of Conservation and Recreation or DCR. And um, the dam owners, are, including the taxpayer are responsible for um, paying for regular dam inspections every few years as to comply with um, needed repairs to these structures for routine maintenance. And often um, dam removal is less expensive than maintenance of these aging structures. And um, there's a lot of opportunities from federal and other grants to get funding to help remove these structures to help for with fish passage and other ecological benefits. It's also a lot of technical um, assistance that different levels of government have in this work. And another thing is, you know, it's a one-time cost to remove a dam and you get immediate and long lasting benefits to that investment. And you may be wondering, are these dams bad for the environment? You know, a lot of them are really pretty. You know, South Natick Dam, when you look at that, it's a, it's a really beautiful site, but they actually are bad for the environment. Um, they limit habitat and degrade water quality. Um, for example, upstream of the dam, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, it slows the water down. So that causes temperatures inside the mill pond or impoundment to increase, which lowers the dissolved oxygen, which is not good for your aquatic species like fish. Additionally, sediments back up behind the dam and accumulate behind there, and that's not great because that's uh, lowers the quality of the river bottom habitat for these fish and other aquatic species. Um, additionally, sediments and nutrients also gather in those areas behind the dam. Also, many of the structures don't have any fish passage. And um, as you, you know, some people may say, well, why don't we just put a ladder in some of these dams? Um, you know, you can do that, but fish ladders don't improve the water quality. You still have all the water quality um, problems in the upstream part of the dam. And also it doesn't, you know, the fish ladders are really targeted towards specific fish species. So you're not gonna have all fish types be able to use the ladder and not at all flows. So um, you also have fish congregating at the entrance of the ladder, which makes them more vulnerable to predation as well as um, folks coming in and um, for like river herring, you have poachers, which is a concern. And you can see this, and um, like I said, many fish will still be blocked by the ladder. And you can see, you know, we have instances of predation over at, um, you know, Watertown Dam, as well as this is a picture just showing all the fish schooling up at Townbrook and Plymouth before they get up the fish ladder there. Um, and there's a great amount of history of fisheries in the Charles River going back to some home rule petitions to the state legislature in 1795 to uh, regulate herring and shad fishery. And this on the right is a scanned copy of a law that talks about um, the opportunity that the town of Natick historically had to regulate their fishery for alewife and shad. Also, we have records going back um, in Brentham of uh, Atlantic salmon reaching up into Eagle Brook which is really far up in the upper watershed, it really blows my mind. Um, and we cannot forget about um, the other, you know, the, the fish still come up in the river. We still have shad, we still have river herring, and we also have um, American eel, which um, migrate from the river into the Bermuda Triangle, Sargasso Sea to spawn. So they go the opposite way. And I wanted to just build off of what Julia said in our landing acknowledgement. Um, to talk about how CRWA has been learning about how dam removals relate to indigenous peoples. Um, the first nation, the, firstly, the Native Americans from the Massachusetts nation had fish weirs at the site of Watertown Dam, which is so-called head of tide, just upstream of the high tide mark. Additionally, the indigenous people in Natick petitioned the state legislature to stop construction of Watertown Dam and other dams because of the impacts to these fish populations which are a critical food and nutrients to us. 
And the dams are really a legacy of colonization, which favors the agricultural col colonial settlers over indigenous people. And this, this slide just talks about, you know, why did C.R. Dibwe first get into dam removal? So back in the early 2000s, we had a program where uh, we partnered with folks at the Division of Marine Fisheries to help stock shad back into the Charles River. And um, after that, we did some monitoring and we found that um, the, Amer the female American shad were not able to pass over the fish ladder at Watertown Dam. And through that, we um, went into exploring, removing Watertown Dam, and that led to the feasibility study, which came out this summer um, surrounding Watertown Dam. So that's sort of the background, but um, we're gonna transition into talking more with Cam about his journey. Yeah, I mean, it can't be overstated how important the uh, transition of fish up the river is to um, the health of the river overall. Um, they're used as indicators of, like from front to back, essentially for the health of the river. Um, before we get down to where these, um, before we get further down river, um, we're gonna start very at the very, very tippy top at the source, which is um, Echo Lake in Hopkinton, where you can see myself and uh, my friend getting ready to do one of the first passes to try to navigate down the river. Um, now I say first passes because I'd done a lot of research going into this navigation project, um, making sure uh, visiting these dams um, before getting in a boat and visiting them on the water, I would go visit them to see if they were safe to portage, how I would portage them, and um, just do it for pure safety precautions um, while doing this because um, your kayak being packed up full of foodstuffs and um, some camping equipment is a little bit more unwieldy than a um, just normal recreational boat. Um, so again, I would say if anybody is attempting this or um, wanting to attempt it, please do your research. Um, I reached out almost immediately to the Charles River Watershed Association. They've got um, tons of resources for you on their website and otherwise, um, including a really handy map that will help you along your way. Um, it was very, very useful. It'll tell you which way to portage, uh, the safest way to portage, and um, where you should look out for fast water, et cetera. So please, um, before getting into the navigation project, just wanted to preface it with um, do your research. Um, definitely reach out to uh, Charles River Watershed Association and they will help you out. Um, and also myself, I would love to be a resource for anybody who'd like to try it. Um, I started here in Echo Lake in Hopkinton and almost immediately crossing that lake, you have to portage. Um, it is the most water um, I saw in that upper part of the river for um, tens of miles. Um, right after that, you drop in uh, to a pretty much uh, slow moving creek. And I, from there I had to dra uh, drag the kayak um, until our next dam area, which was Wildcat Pond. It's what you see, almost the first image that you see in that little teaser trailer that I had done for the talk. Um, it was essentially void of water at the time. It's um, holding up Wildcat Pond in, and um, you know, you drop into essentially a, a creek of nothing. That one dam in particular, um, it's not too remarkable. It's, you know, essentially a couple boards holding up a little bit of water, a bit higher than it. Um, and from the top area of the river, I kind of like to call area zero, it doesn't really get a lot of traffic from recreation. Um, there's not a giant water flow there. So um, when you go to places a little bit farther down river and have to, um, you know, when you eventually land into greater water flows where there are these dams, um, it's pretty tricky traveling. Um, I found the best way to go is to drag the boat. Um, but that, that, then again, that was in 2020 when there was a very serious drought happening. Um, it may be a little bit easier to pass now, but you still have to um, portage quite a lot. There's tons of obstructions upriver. Um, 
One of the um, greatest obstruction was in Milford Pond, uh, was essentially dried up at that time. That's when you saw me kind of skiing my kayak through um, just inches of water the best I could. Um, this whole trip, essentially, um, one of the tags that's put on it is it's continuous, first and foremost, um, which means I never um, essentially got out and stayed at a hotel or um, stopped to get food at a restaurant, et cetera. Um, it's all packed into the boat. And it's also, um, I would have to sleep in my boat or um, just on the shore of the river. In one case, I had, um, you know, tied my boat up to a bridge and slept in the boat underneath the bridge. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I think it was just before where we're going to get to next, a dam of interest, which is, um, the Box Pond Dam. Um, so the Box Pond on your approach, it is um, other than Milford Pond, where you would go through a series of dam or, or just a dam and then kind of have to go underneath. I think it's high. It's higher up Route 16 area um, into and underneath the road area where you saw me kind of walking into that big concrete tunnel. Um, and then after that, um, you go through another stretch of winding low water. And then you eventually find yourself in just enough water to paddle through until you arrive at the Box Pond Dam. I had one question, Cam. So did you, yeah, so you mention that you were um, brought your own food? Did you end up cooking any of that food at nighttime or did you bring sandwiches? Yeah, so I utilized a, um, a small butane stove uh, it's called a jet boil. Essentially what it can do best is boil water um, at very small portions and mixing it in with dried meals. Um, I don't know if I would do that my next time around. I'm really trying to cut down as much weight as possible on uh, the next attempt. Um, but I am, yeah, again, I kind of brought like a couple bags of um, uh, granola, that kind of stuff. I had some like of those very high protein um, bars that you can find at any of the, of your, um, you know, GNCs and sort of places like that. Um, it was very lean and I was very hungry afterwards. Um, but you know, it's all in an attempt to try to cut down time, um, at this point, but, um, yes, first time I had done it, brought a jet boil. I had some like kind of powdered lasagna one night. Um, and that was pretty nice. The sleeping is, is pretty crummy as well. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, about a three day journey. My first time took me about um, 80 hours to complete all of it. Um, but it was worth it. And I'm going to do it again. <laughs> awesome. So as Cam was talking about the first dam that we're going to talk about today is the Box Pond Dam in Bellingham. And this is the dam on the main side of the river that's really in the worst condition. Um, in the whole, you know, main stem of the Charles. It's, we, we found out in a, the recent dam inspection um, that um, it is in unsafe condition. So that is the lowest rating you can get for a dam. And it's an 150 year old low hazard potential structure. And it's at the site of an old box factory with, you know, where the name of the dam and the pond comes from, owned by a private um, company. As you can see from the photos here from the Pair Corporation from the inspection report that we got um, in 2020, there are trees growing on the dam and you don't want trees growing on a dam. It's really not great. Um, and water flowing through the structure. So also it was identified in the town of Bellingham's hazard mitigation plan as potential for breach. And um, you know some action is gonna have to be taken here, whether the dam owner decides to remove the dam or the dam owner has decides to repair it. There's gonna to have to be something here because it's really not in the best shape. Um, and when, Cam, when, when we went um, to see the Box Pond, the area upstream, you know, we went in the winter, the people were recreationally fishing for ice fishing. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I saw a lot of recreation on this. I saw several boats out on Box Pond. It's surrounded by several homes. 
Um, and also, um, as I'm trying uh, during my portage, as I'm kind of pulling my kayak up and over this dam in particular, you can see evidence of it around. You can see, um, you know, fishing lures left behind, string left behind, um, you know, um, a little bit of, you know, just like refuse around as well. So it's kind of, um, it's interesting that this is uh, in such bad or in such disrepair, right? Um, I feel like because there is so much recreation, um, it may give uh, like kind of a safety issue in this case, uh, just because there's recreation surrounding it. Yeah, definitely, it'd be interesting to see what the dam owner ultimately decides because um, it is a privately owned dam and they, you know, when it's a privately owned dam, they sort of have the ultimate decision-making power on what, what to do, whether to repair it or remove it. So we're gonna make our way downstream to the next dam, um, which is the North Bellingham Dam, which is a 179 year old um, mill dam. It's a significant hazard potential structure. It's in poor condition, owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, which bought it when they developed the Natural Valley Storage Area. It was part of the land acquisition. Um, and from our research, we've discovered at Sierra Bay that it's partially breached on both sides of the river since at least 1987. And this, like the last dam, it's um, got trees growing on it. The waters, you know, when we went, Cam and I went a couple of weeks ago, you can see the water flowing underneath the spillway and through the structure. Um, so it's, it's not in the best shape. Um, and there is a, if you want to visit the dam, you can. There's um, on the side of the dam, there is a access um, from the Conservation Commission. They have some land there, which is nice. So what, so Cam, how, how is this section of the river upstream and downstream? Upstream of this dam is pretty stunning. Um, there, are, you can see it in that top picture, that top right picture on the very top left of that image, you can see those tall reeds, um, that kind of yellowish grass. There's lots of that in a stretch. If you are taking a boat out in that area, um, there's um, lots of wildlife as far as birds, especially um, for all the birders out there. Um, there uh, is, yeah, there's, there's enough water to get paddling up through there. And it's actually one of my favorite um, kind of grassy areas in the Charles. It's kind of interesting and feels so much different than areas downriver to be able to paddle yourself through that tall grass. Um, yeah, pretty remarkable. And downriver from this dam, um, it again narrows quite substantially. Um, it, you know, there's in this top area, pretty much until you get to the Populatic Pond, um, it's there's tons of obstructions. Um, so you find yourself kind of, if you are a recreational paddler, having to pull yourself up and over these obstructions as well. So it's not the easiest of paddles, but um, it's rewarding. Uh, definitely, I would recommend wearing some waders in case you have to hop out of the boat. Yeah, and Cam, when you say obstructions, what do you mean by that? Like trees falling down or beaver? Yeah. Down? Um, so in low water, it would be anything from trees falling down across or just areas where there's not enough flow that you can get your boat through. So having to go over shoals, um, but the majority of it is, uh, as you as you said, trees falling down. There's actually quite a bit of beavers up there as well. So beavers will also set up their own little dam systems, um, you know, far less effective than the ones we're talking about today. But um, they do kind of place little obstructions across the river you got to pull your boat over interesting yeah so as we make our way down river um we got a section of um stream that was recently restored back in 2017 it's off of beach street in bellingham and um it's a really cool spot it's where the old mill was used to used to exist right off of beach street there um, as you can see on the photo on the right. And um, like I said before, there were a total of 10 dams on the main stem of the Charles River since colonization that have been uh, breached or partially breached. So this is one of them that's been removed. And um, there used to be um, a mill building downstream of this, but I believe the town of Bellingham took that building down. So Cam, so what was it like in this section of river when you were coming down up from the North Bellingham? 
So this section, you know, prior to speaking with you, Robert, I, I didn't know that there was a dam here. Um, or so it was actually kind of lovely to go and not have a, um, a large obstruction to have to portage over. I approached this dam a lot like the Carryville Dam as well, which is in, in the relative same area. It's, you know, going through there, I expected to have to, you know, take the boat out and sometimes, you know, have to wrap wheels around the bottom of my kayak and drag for some time, which is required for some of these portages. Um, but, you know, just being able to cruise through this area, it was really lovely. Uh, to speak on the Carryville Dam as well, now that we're kind of in the same area, um, that one's really interesting. You know, there's lots of evidence of what this dam used to be. It definitely recognizable as an old industrial kind of place. And um, in parts, a little bit tricky to navigate because of, you know, large concrete structures, man-made concrete structures that are, you know, still kind of crumbled into the side of the water. It had a real like, you know, post-apocalyptic vibe to the Carryville Dam. Um, you know, not the most uh, nature rich section, but it's very short. And once you get through it, you know, again, you kind of get more of the Charles River natural beauty. Yeah. And that's, so I know the old mill is also known as Carryville. So I believe the dam was sort of upstream of the bridge. So when you went under the bridge and then when I looked over there on the other side of the bridge, that's where that sort of comes in, where it was the old mill building. Is that what you're describing? That's the one. Yes. That's the spot. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what the town ends up doing with the property um, as well. Maybe they could do some stream restoration there to help make it less of a channel, you know, potential. So as we continue downstream, the next dam on the way is the 194-year-old low hazard potential um, West Medway Dam. It's also in poor condition like uh, the North Bellingham Dam. You know, interestingly, it's one of the dams that's owned by a defunct corporation. Um, so there's no known maintenance. It's an old mill dam. And the last inspection for report we were able to find from Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, was from 1998, which was even before DCR existed. It was actually DEM, Department of Environmental Management, which had um, this dam inspected back in the 90s. Um, when we went to go, there's a park upstream of them. And that's where we took this picture from on the right by the police station. But I, I, we weren't able to get to this area on foot because this is across the river. So, Cam, do you want to talk about you know how this you know this dam was in your reconnaissance to do this project? For sure. So approaching this from upriver, you start to get more of a substantial river-looking river. I mean that in the sense of the Charles River that most people are used to seeing. Um, you know, it's um, water like from three to five feet deep or even deeper in some areas, um, easier paddling. It kind of opens up in the approach to this dam. But this West Medway Dam in particular was tricky because I didn't find that viewing point, my first kind of pass in doing my research. So this one, I even went to go ask that police station um, if there was access, because it was marked on the Watershed Association map. So I had gone to ask the police station if I could just go behind and see the river. And they said that, it, you know, that would be trespassing. So I had to approach this river um, sight unseen, or excuse me, I had to approach this dam sight unseen. Um, and that was cause for, you know, a fair bit of anxiety for a bit of the, for a bit of that trip. Having seen it, and of course, following the directions that are on that watershed map, um, it is a fairly easy portage. Um, there is a good spot to kind of bring your kayak up to the right of that dam and pull the kayak out and then drop in underneath the, the, um, that flowing in fast water. Um, but um, that being said, it is still, you know, the more water flow that moves through there, the trickier it is to kind of put your boat down into it. So getting back into the boat causes a, you know, um, it's a little bit trickier, but at the same time, as long as you're, you know, um, able to kind of balance yourself back into that boat, you're good to go. Awesome. So the next, as you make your way downstream, it's pretty like a short distance, right, Cam, between this and the next dam? Yes, it's, it's 
quite short. You can, on paddling, it's probably, I want to say, an hour's worth, less than an hour to get there. Um, again, the water flow is substantially better. So maybe it just felt like it was really fast because before the West Medway Dam, um, the paddling was pretty slow going. Good to know. And the, so this dam is the Sanford Mill Dam. It's about 93 years old. It's a significant hazard dam in poor condition, which is it's also owned by a defunct corporation. It has no known maintenance. And also, more interestingly, for folks who live downstream, there it's supposed to have an emergency evacuation um, plan and action plan, which it does not have currently because the um, owner is a defunct corporation and they're not maintaining it. Um, interestingly, between this dam and the West Medway Dam we just talked about, there's a cold water fishery stream called Shepherd's Brook in Franklin. Um, and that is, um, has, they have a population of um, wild brook trout, which is sort of unique in Eastern Massachusetts. And if you were to remove this dam, they, those fish would have more access to the large section of free flowing river, the largest section, which is 19.6 miles, just downstream of the Sanford Mill Dam. And from the inspection report we got from 2019, uh, repair costs range from 400,000 to $1.42 million and dam removal range from $715,000 to $1.26 million. Um, and it's really, it's an iconic structure. You can see it from the road. Um, and when we were there, Dan, um, Cam talking about, um, you know, taking pictures from the bridge, you were telling me about this portage, which I found interesting when I was looking at the, our Charles River Canoe Guide, it suggested doing a different portage than what you did. Yes, and I would definitely recommend the, um, what the guide states. Um, the portage, although very, you know, it's, it's pretty beautiful to look at from at the top of the bridge, but when you're right up next to it, this dam in particular, as far as portaging it, is, is fairly intimidating. And um, it's absolutely possible and best, uh, best practice for this dam is to portage. Um, you can actually see the area at the very top right of the photo, just past that building on the right. You see a little bit of grass kind of peeking up right there, pulling the boat out there and then um, dragging. Essentially, you're going through an apartment complex parking lot and then um, putting in a little bit down the corner underneath that a ways away from where that waterfall is. Um, what I had done in my um, port, in my navigation attempt, as well as the um, you know preemptive runs, is portage on the opposite side, which entailed a uh, essentially having to pull up a fair ways away from that waterfall um, upstream or upriver, excuse me, and yeah, pulling out and pulling that kayak about thirty to forty feet uphill, and then back down across the other side and putting it at that very bottom place where your cursor is indicating. Now, because it was very low water at that time, there was a whole other section of earth to be able to um, slide the boat down and then position myself to be able to get into it. With this amount of water and probably with the amount of water I'm going to see in spring and um, hopefully it's not such a bad drought in the summer. Um, with this amount of water, it the amount of risk is uh, much, much, much larger. So I definitely wouldn't recommend doing it. I wouldn't try it personally. I would take the recommended route. Um, but putting the boat down essentially on the opposite side downhill, um, I kind of had to tie it to myself and lead it down in front of me and let it go down into the water. And then kind of climbing that downhill and then positioning myself to, again, get into that boat with the fast moving water as well. So um, this is one of the more challenging portages because I had not done it the correct way. And um, even despite the research, it's important to have a good sense of your like risk assessment for when you're, um, when you're attempting something like this. Awesome. I see one question in the Q&A, which I'm going to answer because it kind of goes off of this dam. But um, with respect to the the question is, with dams owned by defunct corporations, who is responsible with no inspection in 20 years? Isn't that a liability? Um, 
second part of the question, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems like it's a potential liability. Um, and with respect to, you know, if it's a defunct corporation, who's responsible that. So from what we've been learning a state every way, the office of dam safety at DCR, they have a list of dams that are in this predicament where there's not a known owner or it's a defunct corporation or that sort of thing, similar to the last two. And they go, they, they go by hazard, um, you know, code. So if it's a high hazard dam, they start off with those and they actually have to go in and do a title search to look at who owns the dam and figure that out. And they can go to court and try to, you know, hold the owners accountable to, to fix the dam. So that's something that they go and look at, but it takes a long time is what I've been learning. Um, but it's a definitely interesting question. Thanks for asking. So once you get through um, the Sanford Mill Dan, you are into the large, the longest free flowing section of the Charles River at 19.6 miles. And you know, there's obviously a ton of wildlife here. You can see the, the pictures of the birds, the duck. Um, one interesting thing is there used to be two dams in this stretch that are no longer there, the Rockville Dam and the Baltimore Dam which are now breached. And the Rockville Dam was located on the Millis Norfolk border near the confluence of the Mill River in present day Norfolk Arena in that area. And Baltimore Dam was located near present day Route 115 on the Millis Norfolk border too. So it's a cool section. Yeah, it's a great, it, it's a beautiful section. Definitely one of my favorites of the, um, of the river. There's, like you said, lots of wildlife. I was seeing deer. I was seeing, um, there are some like beavers and otters around that area. Um, you know, it's lush. There's so much birds, uh, so many, so much birds. There's, there's so many, uh, there's such a diversity of birds there. Um, and so for you birders too, again, this is just such a lovely spot to be able to go. There's those tall grasses on either side and some of the stretches, um, you get to, um, there's lots of walking paths as well. Um, there's a lot of reservations on either side of the river as you're going through this stretch. So um, you can kind of get lost and forget that you're in Massachusetts. Um, you know, for all the, the city folk, this is a, a great place to kind of escape that for a day. And also there's a lot of sections of the Natural Valley storage area in this area, which it was designated um, by um, it, was, it was enacted as a part of the Army Corps of, Res, um, Army Corps of Engineers. They they at, uh, acquired and, and bought a bunch of properties of these wetlands to help preserve them um, in perpetuity to help for flood storage. So it's an, another cool section of the river. There's a lot there, but there's also other sections of the river where there is natural valley storage area, including North Bellingham, which we talked about. So the next dam on the list is the South Natick Dam or also known as the Charles River Dam in South Natick. And it's an 88 year old high hazard structure. Um, it's in fair condition. It's owned by the town of Natick. And right now the town is deliberating whether to remove the trees on the earthen part of the dam, as you see there on the pictures here, um, or breach the spillway here and restore the river um, and um, keep the trees. So currently there's, um, you know, the town's going through a local process. They have a committee set up that's going to make a recommendation to the select board. So if you are interested in this, it's a great opportunity to help get your voice heard. Um, the committee is, I believe, on a hiatus at the moment, but they'll be back deliberating in the summer. They're doing some fact finding, which I'll talk a little bit more. Um, and this dam has a feathered friend who lives very close by. <laughs> it does, yes. Um... So in approaching this dam, uh, I did not get such warning because uh, there isn't one from upriver. So as myself and my friend are approaching this uh, river, um, essentially we had done a, a segmented version of this navigation project. So as I was um, doing this over again and approaching this area, this um, swan didn't really want us around and that's fair, but the way it came in, um, we're watching it and we're like, is that thing coming straight for us? 
And it came in like, these things are extremely intimidating up close. It comes in flying low like a helicopter and lands extremely close to our boats, just making itself extremely massive with its wingspan the size of a dinner table. And um, essentially I reacted like, I, I'm not gonna lie, I panicked a little bit and reacted like I would if I was approached by a bear, like just making as much noise as possible you know, you don't want to like, yeah, just, just making as much noise as possible and trying to make myself look like I'm too intimidating to, you know, to be messed with. So I think it calmed it down a little bit, but I got escorted out of that area by that swan for sure. I just paddled my way out and it watched me go like a bouncer. So um, definitely be careful around the, uh, the upriver part of that dam. Um, there's a swan that really, really you know, that's its home. So just be careful. The portage as far of that, um, at that dam is essentially that earthen area to the right of it. So if you're going down river, um, you pull up to the right side and pull over that dam and then move into the lower aspect of the river. The thought of these two sections, um, the section that's underneath the um, South Natick Dam and that 19 odd mile stretch above those being connected and being like unified in a way is exceptionally uh, attractive to me as a recreational paddler. Um, and just the thought of those two stretches, because the, the one up until the Cochrane Dam, which is next, is just extremely beautiful as well, one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so it's it's pretty um, it's pretty remarkable that that might be able to get done. It's awesome to hear. It's also, I got this cool video we got from the town of Natick. So look at this area. You can see a trout. It's kind of loud. So you can see a trout trying to hop upstream, but it can't. I mean, there's a, um, they have a uh, fish ladder here. It doesn't work very well, but there are trout in the river and downstream, there are two cold water fisheries, Nonantic Brook and Trout Brook in Dover, which have more cold water fisheries. So there are trout that want to get up into that 19.6 miles to um, have more access to food and more spawning habitat. Um, and like we mentioned, the, the, the four upstream dams are in poor condition or unsafe condition. And if you remove this dam and if you remove the um, Sanford Mill Dam, which we just talked about, you could connect Shepherd's Brook, the wild brook trout in that brook, to all those other brook trout in uh, Dover for the first time in 100 years, which would really be amazing. Um, you know, as a, um, you really want the different fish to be able to spawn together to keep the gene pool fresh and that sort of thing. I'm going to move on. So the cool thing about South Natick is because they're going through the process of determining whether to remove the dam, there are renderings that the town has um, made to look at what it would look like if the dam were to be removed or if they were to repair the dam. So this um, is a picture of what they would do is if they repaired the dam and removed all the trees, um, you're looking at it from the impoundment area, looking towards the road here. Um, and this is if they would keep the spillway and um, repair the dam, this is one view. And the town is, is looking at doing more renderings and they've hired Stantec through the Division of Ecological Restoration to do even more refined renderings, which is cool. So this is one rendering. Another view looking the opposite way, as Cam was saying, the portage is sort of over this earthen part of the dam. Um, you can see this would be if the trees were removed and they kept the spillway. Another view courtesy of the um, town of Natick. And this is a view as if they restored the river and removed the spillway here. And this is an estimate of how much water would be receded at, at the impoundment mill pond area. And you see, keep the trees. There's another view looking upstream. Um, and, and the like I said, the water would go down a bit and the town is looking to refine renderings to make you know, with Stantec to look at how far upstream does the influence of the dam go and that sort of thing. And those questions will be answered um, in that process. 
Here's another view looking from like a drone shot. And this view is coming from uh, the park area on the side of the river, looking at the um, other side of uh, where the earthen part of the dam is. We have a couple. All right, we'll move on downstream. So we kind of skipped a couple dams, but um, you know, there's another big free flowing section below the Cochrane Dam, which we didn't really talk about today. Has more sections of a natural valley storage area, which is really beautiful. Um, but the next major, there's two dams below Cochrane Dam which is the Silk Mill Dam, which isn't pictured here. And right below the Silk Mill Dam in part of Hemlock Gorge State Park is the 116 year old um, significant hazard potential dam in fair conditions called the Metropolitan Circular Dam. It is owned by DCR um, as a part of the Hemlock Gorge State Park. And this is sort of the end of the road for river herring. Um, so the alewife and the blueback herring because there's no fish ladder at this dam. So this is as far upstream from Boston Harbor that those fish can get because um, there's no fish passage structure at the site. And it's, you know, a low head dam. It's really a beautiful site. Um, so Cam, how was, how was it navigating those two dams to get into this point? Um, navigating down the um, Cochrane Dam and then Further down to where we are now, um, Cochrane is a, is a relatively easy portage. Um, you have to, you know, drag a fair bit um, and put in on the opposite side of the river. For this one in particular, um, the circular dam, I've done it in two ways. Um, one way I had portaged up to this point where we're essentially standing in this photograph and I dropped in just below the, um, the waterfall there in between where that bridge is. Essentially, I just kind of use the same method of dropping my boat down first and then climbing in after it. Um, and that's not something I would recommend doing anymore. That was my first time and I, I lived and learned and I followed the, um, the recommended path, which is going across the river from this photo here and pulling out the boat on the opposite side. You have to cross underneath route nine and then there's a path that allows you to drop the boat in underneath these, um, these dams as well. The first time around, um, I think I was able to do so because there was such low water in the same aspect as the, um, the Medway Dam, you know, that high water plus the dams, the kind of waterfall being so close, um, it would pose an extremely risky situation in, um, in trying to do that with high water flow. Um, so here moving into um, you know, the next kind of set of dams and even in between here, there's a lot more kind of um, you know, population presence around, right? So you'll be going down the river and you'll see kind of the backs of businesses. You'll see you know, um, a street running directly, you know, lots of bridges and streets going directly adjacent to the river itself. You know, so there's, there's a balance that's kind of between seeing a little bit more um, population presence that's in the river, including kind of refuses that are on the side of the river. But I have to say that I was surprised between here and um, a little bit further down through Newton aspects, uh, areas of the river, there's lots of great wildlife still. Um, there's still, I still saw deer, I still saw um, beaver, and, you know, I saw lots of birds. It was remarkable even like going next to 95 and Route 16 in these areas, there's still like a beautiful amount of um, a beautiful amount of flora and fauna that's in these areas. Um, definitely recommend just trying to um, see where you're closest to the river and explore that area because it's right there in a lot of these metropolitan areas um, and lots of opportunities to enjoy the river safely and, res and responsibly. Yeah, it's definitely, and I know this location, you, the state park, I've, I've walked here, it's beautiful. You can see the Echo Bridge. It's, you know, fantastic spot. If you haven't been to the section river, even on foot is, is really amazing. So moving the way down, once you get over under Route 9, or over Route 9, I guess, if you're doing it the proper way, you go over the Cordingly Dam, which I don't have a picture of. Um, and the next dam on the um, list of 
um, dams in, in poorer condition is the 69 year old uh, Finley Dam, also known as Newton Lower Falls Dam. It's 69 years old, um, significant hazard dam. It's uh, like I said, it's in poor condition, owned by DCR. There's a, a pretty good fish ladder to the right of this picture. Um, so the fish, some of the fish do get through here, but how did you voyage around this one? So this one's a bit tricky as well. Um, the dams in this section go one after another. So I would definitely recommend doing your research beforehand um, and also navigating yourself without a boat or anything like that to find the quickest path to get across if you're interested in doing the portage. This one in particular is pulling the boat out to the left of this dam and you have to drag or wheel your boat around and across the street, across Route 16 there into the back of a parking lot to be able to drop in underneath this, um, this section of dams. So um, I was looking um, mighty haggard um, at this point in my journey and I still had my waders on and a little, little bit frazzled as I was like just crossing Route 16 with a kayak and you know got a couple interesting looks from people, but um, hey, it was a lot of fun. Awesome. And downstream of this, you got the beautiful Lake District, which you're not really going to talk about tonight. But then below the Moody Street Dam, you got, uh, oops, you got the Bleachery Dam, which is an interesting story. It's a 203 year old low hazard potential structure in satisfactory condition, also owned by DCR. DCR owns all the dams from Cochrane Dam to Boston Harbor. Um, back in 2005, there was a partial breach of this dam on both the left hand and the right hand sides. It was a, it was a partnership between uh, CRWA uh, Division of, of Marine Fisheries or DMF and DCR. And you can see they literally cut pieces of the granite blocks to let more fish passage through this area. So this is one interesting story of fish passage. Um, and also it's just a very interesting dam. Yeah, on, a, on approach, um, essentially um, going over this dam, you can do it in two ways, uh, depending on the, the state of the water flow. Um, at one point, I was able to just step out of my boat and step over the dam and then drag my boat over like I would a smaller obstruction. Um, on a secondary pass, um, I would have to pull the boat out on the right side and then drag around and put in underneath the bleachery dam. It's definitely, um, you know, when approaching these dams in any sense as a recreationalist, um, just trying to you know, assess the safest way to do it in any case possible. So if there is any kind of, if you find something to look a little bit too risky, it probably is. So there's plenty of methods to be able to get around these things in this point of the river. So I suggest utilizing the, the easiest way. Thanks. And a couple miles downstream, we got the Bemis Dam, which is a 244-year-old uh, breach dam, which is also owned by DCR. And you can see these photos that Cam took of the breach. And you can see parts and the remnants of the old dam structure. Interesting story, it was breached in 1944. And CRWA and Newton Conservation Commission back in 1974 petitioned the MDC, or Metropolitan District Commission, DCR's predecessor to not rebuild the dam to help serve this breach to serve as fish passage, what it still does today, um, which is, I, I find that, I found that was a really interesting story, which I didn't know. Yeah, this stretch actually in these photos, you can see just a little bit of like fast water in that middle photo there. Um, that essentially, um, if you're attempting to boat in this area or do any kind of recreation, just be aware that this is here because it's one of the faster moving areas that's on the river. Um, it's that corner. It kind of just uh, it funnels ever so slightly and just enough to create a little bit of a fast water that pushes you right into the opposite side of the river. So the difference that a couple paddles can make is really big in this kind of area. Um, you can flip over, you can end up getting wet. Um, but I would just exercise a bit of caution. And all this stuff is marked out on that map from the Watershed Association. So um, all the preparation you can do when doing the, um, when encountering the river in any case is, is, is important. 
I do love this area, like before and after this between Newton and Watertown, it's another like really surprising stretch of the river. There's still a lot of wildlife around and great walking paths and bicycle paths for those of you that want to approach the river on land. It's just, um, it's got great old growth trees and I see a lot of people just kind of walking and enjoying over there. This is like right in my neighborhood. So um, I try to get down there as much as possible. Awesome. Second to last, but not definitely not least, is the Watertown Dam, which is a 56-year-old structure, a uh, significant hazard potential structure. It's in fair condition. You know, as we know, it's owned by DCR, and it has a fish ladder on the left-hand side of the river, which is not the deepest part of the river. It's the more shallower side, um, which passes um, the American eel. It also pass the eel can also just climb over the dam structure. Um, but it also passes the river herring, like the alewife and the bluebacks. But we found out, as I said before, through um, studies by Division of Marine Fisheries that it cannot pass the female shad, which is really unfortunate. And that's why um, one of the reasons why Sierra Debris is really keenly interested in removing this dam. And it's sort of, um, you know, one of the first navigational, you know, um, impediments, not only for the fish, but for paddle is that right cam yeah that's right um going this makes going up river from you know further down a lot more challenging in this case uh, or going down river in my case um it's a fairly easy portage um you can get off the river much like the earlier um bleachery dam you know there's the walking paths that are just to the right of it so it's an easy um kind of portage, pulling your boat out and then dropping it in right underneath the dam there. Um, this again, I mean, it's it's understated how much like bird um, diversity there is there. And this is where I saw uh, actually a night heron, which was super, super cool. Um, I've only, that's the one and only night heron I've ever seen in my life. And I've been on the Charles River, you know, nearly my whole life. So um, it's surprising it, through and through. Yeah. The other fish that's there is the um, migratory fish is um, rainbow smelt, and they really can't do fish ladders either. So even if you try to build a fish ladder there, they wouldn't be able to get up. And their habitat is being um, inundated with sea level rise. So removing the dam would help, you know, expand their habitat even further up. But we have some cool renderings that we have um, because of like, you know, South Atlantic Dam, Sierra Way is, is interested in removing Watertown Dam, and there was a feasibility study done by um, the state, and um, this is the current view you see from California Street. Here's a rendering that Sierra WA um, had done um, after the feasibility study was come out, um, and you can note that there is a lowering of the water level slightly in the area, and you can see there is also some, you know, they could have the opportunity to put some more stones or boulders in the area and there would be ripples. So you can still hear the sound of flowing water over the rocks, similar to the spillway, obviously it's not the same. Um, another cool view is, this is a drone image from above. Um, this was during construction, so obviously it looks a little different. Um, and this is a rendering that was part of the feasibility study looking downstream. Um, obviously the bridge is, is here. This was done when they were building a new bridge this is during high flows. So it wouldn't be sort of like this in normal flows, but you can see more easily passable through this section and you'd be able to kayak right through. Um, and they can, and when they do as a part of dam removal, they, there is a design phase and you can incorporate things like fish passage, but also recreation. And last but not least, we got the new trials dam and the Gridley Locks. And this is a 44 year old high hazard potential dam owned by DCR, it was built by the Army Corps. It's got the locks for navigation and flood control, and it regulates the tide and the levels of the lower basin area. And um, also this is not a dam that obviously we're gonna have removed because it is a flood control structure, but um, it is a very interesting um, place because you got the, the locks. Cam has been through it. I have not been through the locks. I do want to try it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Definitely, again, do your research before approaching this one. Um, call to make sure that the locks are open. 
um, first and foremost, and that you're able to pass through on that specific day. Um, bring a horn or a whistle with you to be able to call the, um, the operator. Um, you will be around and um, boating around um, much larger boats at this point. So again, exercise all the caution in the world. Definitely um, wear your life jacket in this area. Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot of footage from this time because I was a little bit nervous myself going through the, the locks. Um, there are traffic signals, essentially, which will help you on your way through. Um, follow those for sure. A light would turn green and that would allow you to pass into the locks after boats have already exited. Um, they'll close the door behind you and they'll adjust the water level when you're in there. You may be in that lock with a larger vessel as well. So just, um, you know, follow all the directions and you should get through just fine. Interesting thing with this dam too, is that there is a fish ladder, but it's not functional. And all the fish that come in through the river, you know, the migratory, the eels, the um, shad, the alewife, and the rainbow smell, they all go through the locks like the boat. So it's a really interesting story that like us people, the fish come through the locks, and which is similar to the story in our sister watershed, the Mystic River and the Amelia Earhart Dam. So I know it's 8.09, so I think we're going to try to get to some of these questions that folks have been putting in the Q&A. Yeah, we have a few questions and please add in any additional questions that you might have. Um, to start us off, someone mentioned, um, can you just imagine what it would be like if the South Natick Dam spillway is removed and how that would be for boating and fishing? Maybe you could just both reflect on what it would be like to restore that fish passage and recreation opportunity. So, Cam, do you want to you want to start? Do you want me to say something? I'm having, here we go. Um, oh, go. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, so like I was saying before, I I feel like that dam essentially is a gate in more way than one. Um, being able to pass through essentially the area of Needham, Dover, and um, below the Cochrane Dam, Dedham, but mostly Needham and Dover. Before that, it's a beautiful winding um, and um, lush kind of area of that river with plenty of flowing water and not a lot of obstructions at all. So connecting that with another 19 miles of river above it for recreational purposes, as well as for wildlife purposes, I feel like it will just expand that area in such a meaningfully, a meaningful way um, that, that many people can enjoy as well. There's tons of opportunities to Put in a boat in that stretch um, and if it was larger and longer it would just you know uh, impact the lifestyle of the watershed or people around that area of the watershed um, in a positive manner yeah and the person asked about boating and fishing and i think the opportunity of fishing and the increased amount of you know trout species you know the wild brook trout and, and have their opportunity for them to have more habitat for that giant 19.6 miles I think that would be really fabulous to be able to have more folks be able to um, do recreational fishing and be able to paddle upstream and downstream in a safe way. Um, all right. Okay, the next one I would to go along with the migratory fish. Um, an anonymous person asked, how much does the typical fish ladder cost to build? Robert, would you be able to answer that one? I don't have on the top of my head, but I do know that fish ladders, they can get pretty expensive. They can get into the millions of dollars. Um, it depends on how big the, um, you know, dam is. And um, the thing is, like, like I said previously, it's really not as good of a solution. It does, they don't work in all flow situations that need to be regulated. They don't pass all species of fish. They're targeted towards, you know, Normally, you see it for like the river herring, the you know the um, alewife and the bluebacks, and you know the other fish aren't able to get it. So the best solution is to open up the river where you can um, and allow the fish to naturally come up. And also, it's um, the opportunity there is um, with with respect to the uh, the fish ladder. It doesn't solve all of the negative water quality issues upstream in the impoundment. So the slower the water, the lower the dissolved oxygen, 
when you just slap a fish ladder on to a dam, you're still gonna have those issues upstream of the dam. So um, it's better overall picture to remove the dam, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it seems another person in the chat agrees that they're not a good solution and mentioned that there are many fish injured on fish ladders, which I didn't know. That's very surprising, but terrible. Um, to transition, Cam, there are a couple questions related to your navigation. Um, first, one person asks how long it actually took you to paddle. And then another person would was wondering if you ever filtered your uh, filtered the river water and drank it on your journey. Um, it took about 80 hours um, and 79 change. Um, that is the standing record that I'm hoping to break in the future. Um, Yes, I did. Um, I have a lovely filter um, that attaches right to an algae, and a great way to save weight is to not pack in water and to filter it. Um, what I had done is just found um, an area where there's not so many visible solids in the water, and that's like, it sounds gross, but you know, it's like even like small leaves, dirt particles or anything like that, and I would just scoop my algae right up there and um, screw on the top and, and drink the Charles River as I was on my way down. Um, again, <laughs> just be aware of the different things that are in the Charles River as well, uh, invasive species, cyanobacteria, and that sort of stuff. Know where, that st know, know where those sort of things live and tend to be before attempting to do something like that, but um, it was delicious. <laughs> I don't know if I would do that, Cam, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I might try the upper watershed water, yeah. but not the, not the lower basin. I know some some towns do get some drinking water from wells and that sort of thing. So it's, but obviously that's filtered. But I mean, I guess the Nalgene, you know, you have a, fil a little filter. Um, I see a question from Matt um, in the chat. It, is the only issue with removing the dam the cost of actually doing it since nobody owns it, or are other issues blocking progress? That's a good question. So. Um, with respect to that, so with, with private dams, the dam owner has the ultimate decision-making power on that. So it's really up to them what to do in that situation. For the publicly owned dams, um, you know, there has to be a community process. People have to have their voices heard. Some people who live really close to the mill ponds um, really like the view of it. And that can be an obstacle to removal because it is a change. And change is really hard for, for folks. So um, that, that is a challenge, you know, the political challenges of um, making a change, um, especially in some of these um, dam structures um, that makes sense. Related to that, Robert, um, somebody asked, what can the public do to pressure DCR to remove dams? Does Charles River Watershed Association facilitate DCR getting grants to remove dams? That's a great question to the anonymous person. Um, you know, people can, you know, so with the D respect to DCR dams, those are publicly owned dams. They're the people's dams. You know, we, my boss as taxpayers, we help, uh, you know, fund those dams and maintenance, that sort of thing. So we actually have a story map on our website, crwa.org, and we have an, a place where you can share your story. And we definitely encourage you, I think Julie may have it in the chat, um, to share your story about, um, especially Watertown Dam is, is the main focus right at this moment with DCR to, 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 to put pressure on them um, to, you know, look at removing the dam. So that's something that we're doing. We've had multiple Zoom webinars and meeting with local officials in Watertown surrounding it. So if you're interested, you can, you know, share your story, sign up for alerts, and we're going to be doing more actions to help put pressure on DCR to remove the um, Watertown Dam, because that's really the first dam ecologically um, that's really impacting a lot of these migratory fish. Um, and then Nathan asked, is there any proposal to remove the Moody Street Dam and also any possibility to retain small scale run of river micro hydropower at or near dam removal sites, which does not which don't substantially harm fish populations. Yep. With respect to Moody Street, there's no um, proposals to remove Moody Street uh, at this time. You know, there's not, not, nothing on Moody Street. 
the real focus is on Watertown Dam, as well as some other dams um, like South Natick, where they're really going through community process. Um, and Moody Street does have some, you know, flood control structures there. So that's something, whenever you look at removing any dam, you have to do a feasibility study. And you're not gonna do that when they find out that there is a flood control aspect to it. And also there's obviously the Lakes District is a big recreational area too. So um, yeah, there's no current proposals to remove Moody Street Dam. Um, but Santa Bay is really focused on Watertown Dam because it's um, you know the first dam that's really the biggest hurdle to the fish. Um, as well as the other dams that are in a lot worse shape in the upper watershed, um, those are um, a more of a concern. Oh, and then the, the question about hydro, um, it's, it's really not economically feasible and it's not something we really have been looking at um, with respect to the dams here, but people have brought it up um, and it's, it's a fair thing. I've been to the dams out in Western Mass on the Connecticut River, a lot bigger, a lot bigger drop. It's just not, it's not really feasible. And then we have um, two questions from John. Um, what does your beard help navigate and what's up with the Asian snakehead fish? I'm guessing this is a friend, <laughs> Gail. Thanks, John. Um, well, I can feel that one. Um, <laughs> It, no, it actually, it gets in the way quite a bit, you know, I'm thinking um, going clean shaven next time just to cut down time. Yeah. Not so sure about the Asian snake head fish. Uh, that's the first I'm hearing of it. Okay. Um, and then Matthew asks, in theory, what is the furthest up the Charles River that we could go removing dams that does not impact flood protection? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's really every, so the thing about dam removal, every dam is a, a whole different solution. You know, you have to look at all the aspects of the dam. So it's a really slow process. And people, when we're talking about these dams, they get kind of nervous that, oh, are we going to remove the dam tomorrow? There's a lot of permitting. There's a lot of fact finding. There's a lot of information gathering before you even decide whether to remove the dam or not. So I can't really say, um, you know, specific on this because we, we haven't done that research yet, but it's something that um, would be done in a feasibility study. And, and sort of the strategy on this is you sort of start with the dams that are having the worst ecological impact. Then also when you're having a dam like South Natick where they have a choice of whether to spend a whole bunch of money um, fixing up the dam or have the potential to, to you know, leverage more state funds and, and federal funds to remove the dam, that's where it becomes a, a more opportunistic place to remove a dam. So it's really done often where, you know, where the um, ecological benefits are the most, um, where, and also where financially it makes sense for the dam owner um, or for if, if the dam's in really bad shape, it could be a, um, you know, financial, a, a better financial um, incentive to remove it. So it, it's very site specific. That makes sense. Okay, and then we have one more question about hydropower. Given that hydropower generation is less than 5% in Massachusetts, has there been consideration in removing any of the dams that still generate power? That's, that's a good question. None of the dams on the Charles River that I currently know have any hydropower um, at this time. Um, but I do not know of any situations where they're looking at removing hydropower dams in Massachusetts. It's a lot, most of them, like I said, are on either the Connecticut River or the Deerfield River and some of the uh, tributaries out in Western Mass, which I went to UMass Amherst, so I've seen a lot of them and I've kayaked the Connecticut River, but I have not heard of any of this and it's not really in my wheelhouse as, you know, Charles River in Eastern Massachusetts, but it is a great question and I would definitely encourage you, anonymous attendee, to contact the um, folks out in Western Mass at the Connecticut River Conservancy um, and also American Rivers, Amy Singler, she works out in that area. So there's, there's people out in Western Mass, they probably could answer that question better, but 
It's a great question. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have right now, unless anyone else has a last minute burning question, we might be able to move on. We're gonna close this out with a few uh, more slides related to the Charles River Navigation Project. So the Charles River Navigation Project is launching this May. Um, Cam will be inviting river enthusiasts, athletes, general paddlers to challenge him and um, get a better record for paddling the entire length of the Charles River, which to me sounds wild because I don't even think that's possible. That would probably take me 200 hours. But Cam, would you like to give a little pitch for the navigation project? Sure, absolutely. Um, yes, we are inviting competitors to participate in the navigation project. Um, the, although introduced as an athlete, I have to say that I am a amateur at best as far as kayaking. This was a project that I had done on a whim and the uh, 80 hour would, um, you know, or 79 and change record at the moment, I believe can be crushed in the springtime with a better flow of water. I think um, given the right participants, um, also the right sponsors, I was hoping to send out the word and create a uh, event that um, folks can engage with the river and um, have a great time doing it safely and responsibly. Um, so if you're interested in competing at all, please reach out. You'll see my information on a later slide here. Um, also, if you're interested in getting involved in any other way with the navigation project, um, we will be having some more talking points and some other um, great panelists like we had today with Robert. And um, there are some events that you might want to check in with us for. There's um, after this one, which was the first dim removal and recreation, we've got a kind of more athlete or uh, athletic themed kind of talk. Um, we're going to try to go over like what exactly I was packing in, how exactly, um, you know, to prepare yourself for a long-term boat ride, <laughs> essentially. And um, hopefully talking with a much more qualified athlete than myself um, about this process and what it takes to prepare for something like this. Um, in the future, we're also talking to um, scientists who know more about the actual living things in the river that we can go about, how to interact with wildlife, the things in the, in the flora and fauna that I saw on this first ride through. And also as I am um, going to prepare for this next leg, I'll be doing some more legs of the Charles River. We'll be talking about that hopefully in person with Lisa, that would be great. And again, um, we're opening up registration a little later on and hopefully we can get um, enough people to kind of all kind of participate. And the way it will eventually work is opening up a window of time for people to be able to start this navigation and finish it comfortably and safely. Um, and there's a lot more information to come. So please stay tuned. Also to prepare yourself, I can also lead into this. Um, this is the canoe and kayak guide that I've referenced several times in this presentation. Um, it is infinitely helpful. And if not, if you're not doing the navigation project or anything like that, it segments the river into 10 different uh, segments and it's full of really great information. It's a fantastic resource. I would definitely recommend picking that up. It's like, I think it's less than 20 bucks or something like that. But so definitely just like pick one up as soon as you can, if you're interested in the river and, and what's around it and how you can interact with it. And you can find these on our website. They're only $12. $12, yeah. See, <laughs> yeah. like way lower than 20 bucks. Okay. And we wanted to offer one final pitch. I did put the link in the chat earlier, but we recently released a story map about dam removal in the Charles River watershed that goes through the history of a lot of the dams and what the dams mean for fish, fish passage, the ecosystem and climate resilience. So if you have some time, we suggest you can dive into this topic and really um, become a, an equipped river advocate. And towards the end, it also has the action items. If you have time, we would love to 
have your testimonial on hand. Um, you can submit written testimony about why you think dams should be removed and a refilling river should be restored. And you can also sign up for up news updates through email with us uh, there. And finally, here's all of the contact information. Um, you can learn about the Charles River Navigation Project itself by visiting the website, crwa.org slash navigation project. You can stay in touch by subscribing for, to the River Current. And then Robert and Cam have generally generously listed both of their emails here. Feel free to reach out to them with future questions. And just thank you all so much for attending and please stay in touch. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you coming to, to listen in. Okay. With I've that, seen the river for... otters. <laughs> oh, that's true. There was a river otter question. Yep. Have not seen it. And Nathan, it would be great to walk uh, with Charles. I am not so lucky. You know, that's a, that would be a dream, wouldn't it? Yep. Yeah. Seen him in the rivers, though. But good to see everybody tonight. Have a good night, everyone.